Is anyone here from University Heights who lives here now? Oh, great. Welcome to the presentation at University Heights. Well, many people come into contact with University Heights only while passing through it on Melrose Avenue. <laughs> I might add, this is, this is not always a happy passing through. <laughs> Others, football fans, have interacted with University Heights by parking their vehicles on some of its residential lawns, enjoying the short walk to Kinnick Stadium, often with a beer or something a little stronger in hand. Unless one ventures off of Benton Street, Melrose Avenue, or Sunset Street into the more off the beaten path portions of University Heights, most of its area is unseen. What is University Heights and how did it come into being? Maybe it's the name of a neighborhood of Iowa City, you know, like Goose Town. <laughs> or maybe it's a subdivision of Iowa City. To some, that's what it is. Whatever it is, many consider Melrose Avenue that happens to go right through University Heights to be a notorious speed trap. Robocop. <laughs> so we could use an alternative or an alternate title for this presentation. <laughs> At the risk of offending someone who might not like that. Now, I have already found out that there are a couple people from University Heights here, someone who used to be in University Heights. But to begin with, I'll tell you that University Heights isn't indeed an incorporated city. It has no connection with Iowa City. It has its own city council, mayor, city hall, its own police department, even its own library. But it doesn't have a fire department. It doesn't have a public works department for snow removal or garbage collection instead contracts out to Iowa City and other providers for some services. So University Heights does have a connection to Iowa City, even though I just told you it does not. So now are you confused? Here is University Heights on the county map, completely surrounded by Iowa City. In fact, it has been written that University Heights is the only city in the United States that is completely surrounded by only one other city. Oh, there are many places that are surrounded by other, a number of cities, such as the Chicago suburbs. But University Heights may be the only one surrounded by only one city. I would like to know if that's factual. The only basis I have for that is from a friend and from that great source of wisdom, the Iowa City Press citizen. <laughs> And I'll be referring to this community uh, as University Heights, or just UH, throughout my talk. So how did UH get on the map? Our story begins in the early 1920s, when two brothers, Lee and George Kozer, some say Kozer, I say Kozer, purchased some farmland adjacent to the west edge of Iowa City, west of the Iowa River. It appears that they purchased the land from Samuel Sharpless, perhaps of the Sharpless auction people, a Mr. Albert Payne and perhaps others. This is information that's at the Iowa, or the Johnson County Historical Society on one of their placards. The Kozer brothers sensed that Iowa City would be growing to the west toward this property. They knew the university had already built the quadrangle, the Children's Hospital and West Lawn, all on the west side of the river. I think that's true. In their August 7th, 1924 newspaper ad referring to their upcoming lot sale, they mentioned that, quote, one of the largest hospitals in the world is being built on the west side. They said the sale of their lots anticipated a new modern city. They also referred to their new development of University Heights as a new subdivision. The Kozers would sell their lots in UH with a deposit as low as 10% of the purchase price with the balance due in monthly installments. If a purchaser paid cash, a guarantee was given to refund the purchase price if the buyer was not satisfied at the end of two years. Here's a plat of University Heights that the Kozers advertise in the August 23, 1924 issue of the Iowa City Press Citizen. The Press Citizen was just four years old then. It was formed from the Iowa City Citizen and the Iowa City Press, one Democratic and one Republican. <laughs> the Kozers declared that, quote, property west of the river is increasing in value more rapidly than any other part of town. 
That's probably a little advertising hype, huh? To be sure, there were already other developments west of the river, including these offering a significant number of lots in the Manville Heights area. The map shows that these additions were all established around the year 1910 and had already and had ready access to the Crandic rail line that I'm showing in yellow. And you'll note that there's something called the Kellogg School, which is in the vicinity of the VA hospital. That was one of the four schools built in the 1917 time period, the others being the three similarly looking, or the ones that did not look like the Kellogg School, but looked like each other, Mann, Sabin, and Longfellow. All four were built to replace the ward schools of the time. As a further incentive, the Cozers offered their lots at a reduced price during the first week of the sale. After that, the price would go up by 15%. Each lot was to be marked with white stakes, numbered and priced. Work began on grading the streets and putting in the modern improvements. The first lots in UH were sold on Labor Day in 1924. University Heights was on a high plateau at the level of about 785 feet, higher than the adjacent Iowa City area. Here we're looking to the east. You can see the river in the top third of the screen there. The Kozer said that this was, quote, on a level with the flagpole on the old Capitol building. It was said that more than a five mile view could be had in all directions. The Kozers also pointed out that UH was, quote, about the same distance from the business district is Court Street and Muscatine Avenue. You can see that UH was basically treeless in 1924. The UH area includes the highest geographic point in Johnson County. We have to remember that UH was not the only game in town in 1924. Many additions came into being in the first decade of the 1900s, ones that still offered a great many lots. These included the East Iowa City and Rundle additions, also in that same year of 1924, when the UH lots went up for sale, the Morningside edition, adjacent to Future City High School, offered 130 lots. In this September 17, 1924, Iowa City Press Citizen article, it was stated that there were more than 1,000 lots available to builders during 1924 to 1925. Another advertisement declared, quote, the approach to University Heights is through Melrose Avenue, well-lighted, paved, and one of the finest residence streets in Iowa City. There were many large homes along the south side of Melrose Avenue in the area of the future football stadium to be built west of the railroad tracks in 1929. These homes were built in the 1900 era or a little before. The Cozers announced that they did not intend to sell all of their lots right away and expected to take years to complete their new development. And the Cozers were not new to developing property as they had established a small addition on the east side of Iowa City in 1908. It would follow that the development of UH, like many other areas, would come about slowly. There's a tiny little division right there. A little corner of East Iowa City in 1908. And these are some of the other things that were around at that time, too, that were being developed. So lots of competition for the sale of lots. There were some homes in the Cozer's new development that predated UH. For example, this home at 21 Cozer Avenue was built, we think, in 1880. Very nice looking house. Here's another home that predates the formation of the UH subdivision. Built in 1917, it is owned by a friend of mine known to the locals as Jackie O. And Jackie O has a sweatshirt that says University Heights more than just a speed trap. So they, they had some of these things made up. I couldn't find a picture of that. Who today would think that such things as this existed in Iowa City in the year 1924? It was for the sole use and benefit of the Caucasian race. This is part of the restrictive covenants for UH on August 24th of 1924. Pat Yegi furnished that to me. She's a resident of University Heights. Has it been changed? Pardon? Has it been changed? 
well, has it been changed? Well, by law, it would have to be, sure. This, this shows that there were some 21 houses present in UH in 1926. This is courtesy again of Pat Yegi. She was a former council member. Here's a photo taken in 1928, taken from Gulfview Avenue, looking at the University Hospital on the left and the field house on the right. Tom, was the golf course there first? Um, the golf course, I think I have the data on the golf course coming up. Okay. I don't remember how I should. I only give the talk, but I can't remember the exact date here. But I think right around the time, maybe 1925. Okay. It's coming up. Here's a photo made in 1928. Well, it's not really a photo, is it? It looks like a, a sketch. Taken, wait a minute, this is not what I'm talking about. This is what the University Hospital looked like when it was newly built. Of course, a far cry from what it is today, and a lot of the uh, Gothic Tower is obscured now. Now this is interesting. Weber stated that the top photograph was taken by Fred Kent on October 19th, 1929, from the top of the west stands of the Iowa football stadium, now Kinnick Stadium. The five houses on the left are on Olive Court and then Kozer Avenue leads to the top of the hill. So this is on Kozer, for example. No, that's not on Kozer. That, that's on uh, Grandview. Grandview, yes, yes. At the top, yes. Heading up that way, right. So I presume the bottom photograph was also taken by Kent on the same day. The second house from the right of the picture is a home built for Lee Kozer probably in 1928. It was later owned by Robert and Dottie Ray, no. and currently the home of the Canellas family. It's 305 Gulfview Avenue. Canella, Dave, Canella, Dave Canellas was the father of Mike, who lives here now, and Mike's wife is Dottie's daughter. Mm -hmm. Mike, Mike is a, a dentist at the University of Iowa. Here is the original Kozer home today, and here it is in 1929 by comparison. It's quite an interesting roof line, isn't it, with that, that curve on it. How did Gulfview Avenue get its name? Well, it got its name because of the University Golf Course that was just across the railroad tracks from Gulfview Avenue what now occupies the easternmost portion of this. It would have to be Kinnick Stadium, wouldn't yeah. it? Later, the golf course, of course, was moved more westerly, wester, westerly, right? And we all know it as the Finkbein Golf Course. Do you ever wonder how we got the Finkbein name? Anybody know the history of that? Fink, yes, Finkbein Golf Course was named for Mr. W.O. Finkbein who donated the land to the University of Iowa. The university opened its first golf course on this land in 1925, Ed, so I think that's the one we're talking about there, the, the old one. Finkbein was born in 1857, graduated from the University of Iowa, earning a law degree in 1880. He died in 1930. It shows him about to tee off at the new golf course in October of 1925. Found that just in Google Images, just searching through there, which is pretty neat. W.O. Finkbein and his brother E.C. were millionaire businessmen. They owned and operated an extensive chain of lumber yards in Iowa and also held lumber interests in Mississippi and California. W.O. established the annual Finkbein Dinner at the university and the Finkbein Breakfast at the state's teachers' conventions in Des Moines. The university still awards a medallion during the annual Finkbein Dinner started in 1917 by Mr. Finkbein. Also kind of interesting is that the Finkbein brother's father was a building contractor who supervised the construction of the state capitol building in Des Moines. And that was built over a 15 year period from 1871 to 1886. And that is the only five domed state capitol in the United States, if that's of any interest. That's good. Kind of, okay, here's a photo taken in 1934 from Gulfview Avenue to the Iowa now Kinnick Stadium, looking from Golf View to the Kinnick Stadium. Note the almost complete absence of trees. 
Well, as development of UH proceeded slowly, almost without exception, the residents sent their children to the university, elementary, and high schools. You know, what we called U High, which is in North Hall, present day North Hall. But before that, they were actually in the old dental building that's on Jefferson Street that was torn down in 1975. You remember on the Pentecrest, there was a building that sat almost right on the sidewalk there. This article in the Daily Iowan on July 12, 1935, explained the, quote, University Heights problem. <coughs> Apparently, residents of UH were taken into the Iowa City Independent School District without their consent. On Wednesday, July 10th of that year, that's two days before this was published, the residents of UH, quote, voted unanimously to incorporate and set up their own town, unquote. The residents of UH, still in a rural subdivision, asked, why must we pay taxes to support Iowa City schools when we do not use them? The Daily Iowan article then posed this possibility. If UH would be incorporated into a new town, quote, and a time would come when certain persons in the community were unable to meet tuition payments, then the community would be faced with the problem of providing free education as is required by law, unquote. The Daily Iowan went on to say that, of course, this problem might be solved by the town setting up a school fund for tuition in university schools. The DI further said, in view of the fact that residents of that area have paid for their own paving and sewers and have equipment for light, water, and gas, it would seem unfair that they should be saddled with taxes for Iowa City schools. The DI concluded, However be the problem as it may, there is no doubt that University Heights has been the victim of a rather undemocratic gesture in being taxed without its consent. If I have my date correct, on August 13th, 1935, which would have been just a month after this, the people of University Heights voted overwhelmingly to be incorporated as the town of University Heights. This document, which obviously I don't intend you to be able to read, contains the Articles of, Corp of Incorporation for University Heights. This 1937 aerial view of Iowa City shows how University Heights was the principal residential area that was south of the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroad line on the west side of the river. There was little else there save for some scattered houses. So where are we here with University Heights? right there off of Melrose. There is, it would be in here, yep. this area right yep. here. Very, uh, all undeveloped around it right there. Melrose Avenue was once known as Snooks Grove Road, have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. And also known as the Poor Farm Road, and later, of course, the IWV Road, mm -hmm. standing for Iowa City, Williamsburg, and Victor. After the incorporation of University Heights, the community established a, a police department of sorts. In fact, it may have been in 1934 that a Mrs. Esther Winders, I've been told it's pronounced Winders, became the constable in University Heights. Born in about 1896, Mrs. Winders received her degree in nursing from the University of Iowa. Her father was a marshal somewhere and her uncle a police chief somewhere Perhaps she had it in her blood to become an officer of the law. <laughs> so at about the age of 38, Esther became the town marshal in University Heights. A February 20th, 1969, Iowa City Press Citizen told her article told her story. She was even featured in an article in the April 25th, 1969 issue of Time magazine. By this time, she was around 70 years old still patrolling UH on her white Harley Davidson motorcycle by day and in a bright red 1960 Studebaker by night. <laughs> Esther is shown here in about 1958 sitting upon her white Harley. There's her Studebaker in the garage. Mrs. Winders carried a pearl-handled revolver and was accompanied by her big bloodhound Porsche I'm not sure when she retired, but she was still on the job after 35 years. I'd like to mention a couple of stories about Esther. One from the Time Magazine article and one, another from Irving Weber. In April of 1969, 
Her most pressing problem was a ubiquitous peeping Tom. She said, they're the hardest to catch, but I'd like to put some buckshot into him. <laughs> Another story had it that she frequently attended city council meetings and once brought a pair of new handcuffs to a meeting. A council member posed a question to her, something like, Madam Marshall, suppose you came to grips with a burly burglar. How would you proceed to get the handcuffs on the culprit? That's simple, she replied, tossing the handcuffs to the questioner. At the same time, she whipped out her pearl-handled revolver and barked, now put them on. <laughs> <laughs> Miss, Mrs. Winders died in late July 1985 at the age of 89. Today, the UH Police Department consists of five certified police officers and up to 10 reserve police officers. <laughs> Up to recently, the department operated two marked patrol cars and two police bicycles. I don't know about now, but below on this slide is a quite new police car, apparently, I found parked right here by the senior center a few weeks ago. I'm told that this device on the front is so that they can come up against the car and push it sideways. I thought it was just something to protect the grill, but I don't know whether that's right, but it's a battery ram. Now I want to take a look at the general development of UH and show you maps of it over the years. We'll see how Iowa City gradually encroached upon UH and put an end to future growth. And that is, in fact, if uh, UH wanted to grow more. This is an early information-packed advertisement, very hard, not intended to be read, by the Kozer brothers. It dates to 1925 or 26. You'll notice near the top that they refer to UH as the Coral Gables subdivision of Iowa City. I don't know anything more about that designation. Uh, uh, Gerald, have you heard anything about that? Or, no. And one doesn't hear of it otherwise, as far as I know. The Kozer brothers were the developers and owners of the property, as I had said. Lee was a realtor and George was an attorney. He may have also been a realtor. George lived from 1882 to 1942, and Lee from 1881 to 1949. Those are the only images of them I could find. Again, I think the little one on the bottom right was off of Google Images. It's amazing what you find there. This is the area currently occupied by UH, including a bit north as indicated by the two arrows. I couldn't quite squeeze it all in there. And here are the delineating streets and other landmarks such as the Iowa Interstate Railroad, the former Rock Island Railroad line. Horn School, a lot of people don't realize, is in University Heights. You know, in the Iowa City Public School District. But this isn't the size of University Heights from the outset. Pat Yegi, whom I spoke about before, mentioned that there were 21 separate dedications that made UH the size that it is today. What are called dedications, I assume additions. Here are all the streets of University Heights. I put Emerald Street in parentheses because I think all of the properties on the east side of Emerald Street have Kozer Avenue addresses. This slide shows you the additions to UH from its start in 1935 up to 1953. Wow. And this and the following slides are from Iowa City, an Iowa City website. It, I'm just trying to show you the complexity of the additions to UH over the years. You can't read them really, but it was it's quite a development uh, over time. So it didn't get to its present size at the outset. On this 1939 map, UH is referred to as Kozer Brothers Incorporated. You can read right here, Kozer Brothers Inc. That was somewhat after it, of course, formed as a well, it's just the way it was described on the map. On this 1947 map, I've outlined UH in red and Iowa City in black. Those aren't, of course, the dimensions of uh, just the way I could do it with the computer. Okay, here in 1950, there was still no Iowa City development to the south or west of University Heights. You can see it's just 
nothing there but University Heights and farmland, I guess. The same situation prevailed really in 1960. Here's from a 1960 Iowa City map. So that's getting somewhat recently for a lot of us being here. Here's the, here's the aerial view in 1960. Now, in this view, we are starting to see the, the housing on the part west of Sunset Street. This is part of University Heights that's being developed at that time. So we still have some development in 1960. By 1965, Iowa City is starting to encroach on the south side of UH with the development along Wild Green Road and its side streets. By 1968, such streets as Derwin and Arbery Drives are being added to the south of UH. West High School opened in 1968. Now on this 1969 map, we see the first development to the west of University Heights, where Iowa City is developing west of Emerald Street. Horn Elementary was built in 1969. So here, this is, this is Iowa City, and this is University Heights right there. Here's a 1970 map showing UH and the surrounding areas. And here's an aerial, aerial view from 1970. That must be Wild Green Road here, I guess. Yeah. You can take a moment and look at that if you want to. The 1973 map shows that we now have little more growth south, a little more growth south of West Benton Street. So now by 1973, Iowa City is completely developed around University Heights. So that's 42 years ago. Iowa City annexed the land somewhat before 1973. I don't know what year, but now it's, by now it's all developed. Today, the city of University Heights occupies about 170 acres at the highest elevation in Johnson County. It's almost entirely residential in nature with over 91% of the community devoted to the R1 single-family residential zone. UH has a certain number of rental properties and they are becoming more common. One major apartment complex within the community, Grandview Court, has undergone major renovations and reconstruction. Not sure if that project has been completed. I think it has. You can see the property bordered by Sunset Street and George Streets and Grandview and Oakcrest Street. Oakcrest Street is actually in Iowa City, the one down here. And then we have Oak Knoll down there. Only about 12 and a half acres of University Heights remains undeveloped. This parcel is in the northeastern portion of the city and includes a sizable amount of sensitive woodlands and steep sloped land. The land amounts to just under 10% of the entire area of the city. That's uh, up there. This shows the population of University Heights over the years. You can see that in 1970, there actually was a little more population than perhaps today, at least 1910. It's been quite stable for 45 years or so. Well, it doesn't have any potential to grow, and there, <laughs> I guess you can only get so many people in there. Landlocked. To quote from the City of University Heights Comprehensive Plan of November 2006 and amended in May of 2010, quote, in comparison to its neighbors, University Heights residents tend to be better educated on the whole, tend to work in professional occupations, tend to have higher incomes, and tend to reside in homes with higher values than those in surrounding communities. As a whole, these measures indicated that University Heights lives up to the town slogan, the height of good living. It sounds like a little boasting, maybe, but, but uh, perhaps factual, too. UH has a mayor council form of government. With Louise, is it from or from? What did you say? It's from. From. Uh, she's the current mayor. In 1999, UH opened its first city office. Before that, the St. Andrew Church Parish House was used for city council meetings and as an unofficial police station. Special meetings were held at the St. Andrew Church. Here's a table showing all of the mayors over the years. 
the second mayor, John Nash, his grandson, John Nash, is a friend of mine. And John lived in John's house for a time in University Heights. Here's a table showing, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, the city office is here on Melrose in front of the Nate Moore building, I guess we know it as. Just west of the bridge, over the railroad tracks. I don't think there were city offices until 1999. The majority of public services are contracted out to private firms and surrounding municipalities. There's a fire station in Iowa City and immediately adjacent to the west edge of UH at the corner of Emerald Street and Melrose Avenue that we know about. One might think that the UH, that UH would contract with them, but they don't at this time. I think they may have at one time. But now they contract with the Coralville Volunteer Fire Department. Why would that be? Price. Must be the price. Refuse is provided by Johnson County Refuse, which also provides for snow removal. Water and sanitary sewer services are provided by the city of Iowa City. The current contract runs through 2019, from what I'm told. A UH levy now provides full, fully subsidized library access to the Coralville and Iowa City Public Libraries for all UH residents. Here is a view of the rear of the Nate Moore building with the restaurant on the right. Melrose Avenue, let's talk about Melrose <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. serves, of course, as a primary thoroughfare for University Heights in Western Iowa City. It's also a very important route for those coming in the Kinnick Stadium, for those using the University Hospitals and Clinics, and as Ed said, uh, teachers perhaps going out to West High School from Iowa City, so it's, it's a heavily traveled road. Iowa City would undoubtedly like to see it widened to four lanes. Or maybe they would even go for three lanes. Have you noticed how some of the development is going with three lanes, such as on North Dodd Street, mm -hmm. uh, a long center passing lane? Also, where do we see that on parts of Rochester, First Avenue from Bradford up to the Hy-Vee store, and the new part of First Avenue is going to be similarly laid out with just three lanes from four when they create the driving under the railroad. They found, according to the city engineer, that it's safer than four lanes and handles traffic just about as efficiently. But in any event, Iowa City would like to see something done probably to change Melrose Avenue. But again, from the UH Comprehensive Plan, it says, quote, it is in University Heights' best interest, however, to keep Melrose Avenue a two-lane arterial. I wonder why. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a source of friction between some residents of old cities. And then there's the, the animosity about being ticketed for speeding down Melrose Avenue. All I can say is watch it. I, I'm afraid I'm going to get caught for going too slow or something, but I try to hold it down to... 20 or so, but I go. Always stay below 25. Yes, that's right. Its yeah, reputation for being a speed trap is probably deserved in the minds of most. Uh, I've been told that the revenues from speeding tickets do not add significantly to the city coffers, however. However, in a October 2nd, 1999, Iowa City Press Citizen article, it was related that Mayor Don Swanson of UH released official figures that showed that traffic violations brought in $72,000 plus in 1997, making that over 13% of all UH revenue. When traveling east on Melrose Avenue from the Sunset Street intersection at the end of this slide here, you can see you're coming downhill, thereby increasing the likelihood of speeding up. And I'm sure people are coming in concerned about family and friends at the hospital and so forth, and they might get a, a little stop. Uh, to give you an idea of the UH budget for the 2010 fiscal year, the, Iowa City, or the city budget indicated expected revenues of only about $782,000. Of that, about 70% was from property taxes. And now I'd like to shift my attention to the points of friction with Iowa City over the years with attempts to merge University Heights with Iowa City and talk about the viability of University Heights. Can UH maintain its autonomy long term? And what are the reasons for UH to want to remain auto autonomous? 
Then we can hear from some residents later, maybe. University Heights is in a unique financial situation in that with a very limited commercial base, the city is dependent upon residential property taxes for its revenue. In comparison with surrounding communities, UH has lower tax levies, somewhat lower. St. Andrew Presbyterian Church has purchased property on Camp Cardinal Road and will be building a new church there. I don't know what the current situation is with this property, but there's some 3.4 acres that will be purchased and no doubt the church will be demolished and some sort of commercial development seems to be what's going to happen. I'll have to hear from others as to what the latest situation is on that. I know there's been a lot of talk and with the council there. This is a view from the rear of the property, show that it's quite a large property, and behind that further is, is University of Iowa property. As I said earlier, in 2019, the city will face the renewal of its contract for water and sanitary sewer services. If the city of Iowa City sees fit to offer a much higher cost contract, UH could be in some trouble. The cost of other contract services, if increased significantly, could also be problematic for University Heights. UH spends a significant part of its budget on these contracted services. Even the reconstruction of small segments of local streets, according to the UH Comprehensive Plan, may prove cost prohibitive for the city. Even with the use of bonding to fund such projects, the city may have a hard time paying the requisite debt service. These are probably the major challenges facing University Heights. Tom, did you run across anything for someone here that might know uh, how many miles of streets they have? I heard no. I heard a number once. I just no. can't. I don't I know, Ed. I heard one that was under two miles of actual street surfacing. I would think it would have to be a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah. I would too. That's yeah. That doesn't sound right. Well, on June 13th of 1955, the Iowa City Planning and Zoning Commission recommended that the Iowa City Council, quote, explore the mutual advantages of bringing UH into the corporate limits of Iowa City, unquote. This was the first proposal I think we were talking about when the proposals were. I think this was the first proposal of a possible merger that I found, although the issue may have surfaced before that. Such a merger would require the approval of the voters of both municipalities. Obviously, a merger did not occur, but I don't know what action was taken after the PNC recommendation. Ten years later, in April of 1965, the mayors of both Iowa City and UH called upon their councils to support and promote a merger of the two cities. Mayor Russell Ross of University Heights, you remember Russell Ross? He said a former Iowa City manager once called UH an economic parasite. <laughs> Mayor Ross further said that there was truth in that statement in that the UH residents used many of the facilities provided by Iowa City without proper compensations. UH Mayor Ross, Iowa City Mayor Berger, University of Iowa President Bowen, the League of Women Voters, and the Iowa City Chamber of Commerce all favored the merger of the two communities. The issue came before the voters in September of that year of 1965, and the UH voters decided, decidedly rejected the proposal, 279 to 176. Iowa City voters were about 1,300 for and about 150 against. In early 1977, friction between Iowa City and UH was brought to light in an Iowa City Press Citizen article. Iowa City Mayor Mary Newhauser said Iowa City was seeking more money under its contract to sell municipal services to UH and quote, after two years of negotiations, it has become apparent that it is not possible to reach agreement. Therefore, it has been necessary for Iowa City to exercise its right to cancel the current agreement, effective December 31st, 1977. Apparently, Iowa City wanted to up the cost to UH from $105,000 annually to $154,000 annually. This was for police and fire protection, mass transportation, and refuse collection, and some other things, but not water and sewer, which was $55,000. Mary Newhauser said the price was non-negotiable. 
Later in the year, UH countered with an offer of $126,000 against the demands for $154,000 from Iowa City. In October, the Iowa City City Manager warned major UIH property owners in writing that their services would be cut off at the end of the year. By the way, supposedly a straw poll taken by the UH City Council in the spring of 1977 showed the UH residents two to one against a merger with Iowa City. Since Iowa City and UH could not reach an agreement on services, UH thumbed its nose at Iowa City and went elsewhere. They purchased fire protection from the Coralville Volunteer Fire Department at a savings of $7,000. They hired a freelance policeman, quote unquote, of Conesville to work 24 hours per week. The cost was about the same as UH was paying Iowa City, but UH could now keep the proceeds from traffic fines. In 1978, Iowa City cut off bus service, do you remember that, yeah. in University Heights? Reportedly in response to UH's refusal, refusal to pay the higher price that Iowa City demanded for contracting its services. The buses continued to travel through UH but would not open their doors for people there. <laughs> Iowa City Mayor Robert Vevera said, I will never, as long as I sit on council, agree to letting the people of University Heights ride on those buses for 25 cents when the people of Iowa City are matching that quarter with another 65 cents, it costs us to transport them. <laughs> and Councilor Mary Newhauser declared, University Heights is a city of predominantly wealthy people who don't want to bear the full cost of the community. In 1979, though, Iowa City recanted and restored bus service to UH. And another squabble, I guess, uh, Iowa City and University Heights governments apparently settled quietly on the manner in which the rebuilding of the Melrose Avenue Bridge bordering the two cities was financed. Does anyone know what, how that was handled? I couldn't find any reports of the financing of that. I think it was rebuilt in the late 1990s. So why does University Heights remain autonomous? What do you think? Well, let's look at a few ideas here. These are some of the reasons I came up with. Oh, did anyone hear me say University Heights has its own library? Yeah. Actually, it has two libraries. <laughs> Does anyone know where they're located? Yeah, right there. Yeah. The Near the Melrose yeah. Triangle there? Right yeah. The yeah. These side-by-side -side little libraries are near the intersection of Cozer and Melrose. They say, take a book, return a book. The story I've heard is that a man in Hudson, Wisconsin, build a model of a one-room schoolhouse as a tribute to his mother. You've maybe heard me say in other presentations, she was a former school teacher who loved to read, and he put the model up in his yard in 2009, announcing free books. That's been only six years, and they've just blossomed. Yeah. The man partnered with another one with the goal to build 2,510 little libraries, as many as Andrew Carnegie did, and then keep on going. They reached their goal in August of 2012, and by January of last year, an estimated 15,000 of them have been established worldwide. You can buy them, you can get kits for 250 <coughs> and up. I think we've had them about five years here, I would say. They even have charter numbers on them, as you can see there in the lower right. Well, okay, so <clears throat> to summarize, <clears throat> University Heights is indeed a unique community, an enclave that is completely surrounded by Iowa City. A merger with Iowa City has been proposed on more than one occasion, but has been overwhelmingly rejected by UH voters. UH has faced a number of challenges over the years, but it's always remained autonomous and relatively strong. The challenges ahead, such as a renegotiation of the water and sewer contract, could jeopardize the ability for it to remain autonomous. Changes in the demeanor of the UH Council and its attitudes of citizenry could also lead to attitudinal changes. 
the issue of the redevelopment of the present St. Andrew Church property has yet to be resolved. And the University of uh, Heights has a nice website that contains a lot of history and current information, including the comprehensive plan. And Pat Yegi has put a lot of information on the site as well. So that concludes this presentation.